Hello, I'm Amy Walter. This is The Odd Years, the listener mailbag edition. By the way, that is the actual sound of a mailbox outside of my house. And during the pandemic, when I was sitting in the front of my house, obviously for hours and hours and hours on end, that sound was going on a lot. Anyway, I'm very excited that today I have someone to help answer your questions with me. My colleague here at the Cook Political Report, David Wasserman. Hey, Dave. Hey, I'm wearing my listener mailbag shirt today. <laughs> and I'm wearing my listener mailbag hair. Thankfully, no one can see that. All right, Dave, we're going to start with this voicemail. Hi, Amy. This is Andrew Kiso from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Could you comment on the recent political realignment in the United States amongst both major parties, particularly the shifts along income and education lines? And do you think these shifts will eventually lead to significant party platform shifts from a policy perspective? Thanks. And Andrew, that is an excellent, excellent question about the realignment of the parties and especially among income and education lines. And uh, in fact, I was just reviewing a book uh, that is coming out soon by two political scientists who've done great work on this uh, issue of education polarization. And the conclusion that they come to is that, yes, indeed, we have become more polarized by education, but it's been happening for a lot longer than we think. This is not just due to the rise of Donald Trump, but actually it's been happening, they argue, really since the 1980s, uh, that as we've seen white collar professionals become uh, more democratic leaning, the party has also taken on a lot of those perspectives. And as we've seen Republicans pull in a lot more of non-college voters, the voters that used to be sort of reliably democratic, we see Republicans pick up a more populist edge to their policies. I think nothing it shows just the huge difference when we talk about the education divide than an issue like immigration, which back in the 70s and 80s, Democrats and Republicans were kind of aligned on that issue and aligned on, on a more conservative position on the issue of immigration. And now, as we've seen Democrats become much more aligned with not just college educated voters, but really people with a postgraduate degree, that opinions about immigrants, immigration, Republicans have pretty much stayed traditionally more conservative, kind of where they were um, not that long ago. But Democrats have become much more liberal on that issue. And uh, what I'd like to, to see as we move along is we've, we've um, Dave, and I'll have you jump in here too, but what I find really fascinating, we talk a lot about the change in the Republican Party since Donald Trump has become the, the head, the de facto head of, of the party and sort of driving the policy agenda for Republicans. And again, as I said, a lot more populist, certainly more conservative on immigration. But if you think about where we were with the Democratic Party of the 1990s, a Democratic Party that was headed by Bill Clinton, a very popular Bill Clinton, uh, by the way, who talked about things like welfare reform and a, a very popular crime bill, um, and who worked on issues like banning gay marriage. Um, these are things that no Democrat could possibly work uh, toward in the 21st century version of the Democratic Party. So this is not just a one-sided movement in terms of policy. It's been happening on the Democratic side as well. Yeah. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and you know, the second part of Andrew's question was, you know, whether these realignments and shifts uh, will eventually lead to significant party platform shifts. And I, I'd argue they already have. Yeah. And in 2016, by 2016, Democrats had become kind of a neoliberal suburban party uh, when it came to trade. And, you know, in part, 
that was the evolution of the 90s, uh, the Clinton administration pushing NAFTA through. But by 2016, Hillary Clinton's embrace of the Trans-Pacific Partnership really gave Donald Trump an opening with blue collar voters who had bristled at the at the Democrats evolution on trade, but not yet left the party. And Donald Trump seized that opportunity uh, to uh, to advance a more populist campaign platform. And now uh, Democrats have had second thoughts about moving that far. Uh, Joe Biden has continued many of Donald Trump's trade policies, especially towards China. And the question is, is whether Trump is going to propose so, something even more draconian uh, in confronting uh, China and, and other nations on tariffs. You know, what, what else is interesting, though, Dave, is that um, while non-college, especially white, and I think it, it's also important to note that while we are seeing some movement among voters of color, who have a college degree versus those who don't in terms of realignment, it's not as dramatic as it is among white voters. Um, So when you look at white non-college voters, they have moved more decidedly Republican than white college voters have moved decidedly Democrat. Um, And as you said, even though the Democratic Party now on issues like trade and other sort of neoliberal, but sort of liberal economic policies would seem to be more in line with the the, the traditional Republican Chamber of Commerce, right? Trade, uh, on everything except taxes, essentially, you have a Democratic Party that is, in many ways, more aligned with that. So is, is this link between business and the Republican Party just always going to be there because at the end of the day, regulation and taxes become more important? Or could an issue like trade or tariffs become the thing that sort of separates those kinds of Republicans from the from the party? Yeah, I think, you know, ta- taxes and trade are issues that are now less polarized along party lines than they used to be, even Mm -hmm. as we've seen immigration and abortion become more polarized along party lines. You see, for example, uh, on some of the taxation issues confronting big blue states, Democrats now count on a vast majority of their members of Congress uh, from blue states, and Republicans are, are now more rural in their makeup and from states with lower property taxes. And that has led to um, a a bigger partisan divide over the SALT deduction, Mm. where we are seeing, yes, there is a a cohort of Republicans remaining from New York and California who have made it a top priority to to push to uh, uncap the SALT deduction. But Republicans overall don't have much incentive to do so. Yeah, that's such a great point because if you, it, what we're really seeing now is it's not just uh, that we are seeing voters dividing on education, but that that means that areas that have higher education levels, usually which are suburban and urban areas, are going to be represented by Democrats, and those with lower education attainment are going to be represented by Republicans and their interests on those very issues, Dave, is very, very different. So true. All right, let's take another question. This one is from Marco in Spring Valley, New York. Which House Republicans from Biden districts are the most endangered of losing re-election? And Mm. I love this question because it's right in our wheelhouse. And there are 17 Republicans from Biden districts as we've said, ad nauseum this cycle, and only five (laughs) Democrats from Trump districts. But my question is, how many Republicans in Biden districts will there be in 2024 numbers? Because a lot of those Biden Republican districts may not be Biden districts in 2024, even if they were in 2020, particularly those with large contingents of Latino voters who we see continuing to trend towards Trump in the polls. And that's why, you know, I have big question marks next to 
these Central Valley districts in California, represented by John Duarte and David Valadeo. I still think that uh, California 13, John Duarte's seat, might be uh, the most vulnerable Republican district in California. But if we do see Trump really grow his vote among Latinos, uh, not just in Texas and Florida, but also in California this time, then maybe there is a path to reelection uh, for uh, that freshman Republican in Modesto and Merced. When we look at the entire class of those Biden district Republicans, I think the most vulnerable is Brandon Williams in Syracuse, New York, because he is not only kind of an accidental congressman, he, he came to Washington uh, riding the coattails of Lee Zeldin, who performed really well mm-hmm. upstate in that race for governor, and of course, Kathy Hochul's unpopularity. But Democrats redrew this district in a way that makes it four points bluer and makes it tougher for him uh, to win re-election. There is a competitive Democratic primary underway, uh, but we would consider Williams to be the underdog in that race. Mm. And then, um, Amy, when you consider some of these uh, the other Republicans in our toss-up column, um, not only in California and New York, but also in Arizona, where we have David Schweikert, Juan Siskamani, um, in Oregon, where we have Lori chavez Dreamer, who stands out to you? Oh, gosh, that is really... Uh, a a fantastic question. I mean, um, Dave Schweikert is one of those uh, incumbents who sort of underperforms um, uh, both as a, as a candidate, right? He's not been a tremendous fundraiser. Um, I feel like at the last minute, Republicans have had to go in there before. Now that is a a state that is going to be supercharged, obviously in the presidential and issues like abortion which were important in 2022 are going to be just as important, if not more in 2024 because of a ballot initiative there and the issues roiling that state with the 1864 law. So um, I'm intrigued uh, by that race also because uh, Juan Siskamani, Siskamani, even though he's a freshman, I feel like he understands the swinginess of his district and the moder- the sort of moderate ...ness of his district more than Schweikert does, and that Schweikert sort of votes more like a conservative who represents a safer seat. I feel that way about Mike Garcia, too, in uh, Los, Los Angeles County, where they've been able to put together a pretty conservative record given how uh, moderate their district and in Garcia's district in particular, it's a, it's a Biden, what is it? He did five or six points there. Um, so I'll be curious to see if, if that voting record becomes more of a factor there. And then Oregon five, your, your point about um, that district being in the toss up, that one to me uh, is probably the most challenging only because she's a freshman in a district that, while not as blue as, say, Portland, still has a pretty significant Democratic lean to it. What do you, What about you? you? Would you agree on those, or would you pick another one? There are three Republicans who could be thrown a lifeline if the Democrats uh, are portrayed as, as you know, true pr- progressive believers. There are really three Republicans mm. Uh, who are are facing Democrats that uh, that stand out as potentially too far left for these swing seats, and those would be uh, Jamie McLeod Skinner in Oregon Five. Mm-hmm. Who, right. Even the DCCC has made no bones about it; they want to stop her from winning the nomination in May, and they're supporting a different candidate in Janelle Bynum. Uh, and then uh, in New York's 17th district, where Democrats are poised to nominate Mondaire Jones, who uh, had AOC's endorsement when he was running for a safer Democratic district a couple of years ago, and now is running in a very competitive seat in the Hudson Valley against Mike Lawler, a very hardworking mm. Republican freshman. And then you have in New Jersey's seventh district, which is my home district, this is your typical country club Republican seat represented by Tom Kane Jr., uh, who is very moderate by today's Republican standards, 
the the son of a popular former liberal Republican governor of New Jersey. Right. When they used to and, have, yeah. And Democrats are going to nominate Sue Altman, who was has been one of the leaders of the Working Families Party of New Jersey, a, a, a pretty progressive activist. And will she go over in that kind of seat? So in, in the other seats, whereas Democrats are kind of charting a path towards the middle, the jury's out on whether Democrats can appeal to the median voter in those three. That's an excellent point. And as always, Dave, in a presidential year, it is so hard for an individual House candidate to break through, especially if you're in a competitive state like Arizona. But what about if you are in Oregon or California or New York, where there's nothing on the top of the ticket in terms of a Senate race or governor's race? And obviously the presidential contests aren't competitive there. That's right. And I think those are the places where candidates are going to be able to make the races more about themselves and their opponents. And it it does help, I think, incumbents like Jared Golden in Maine, that you're probably not going to see a ton of spending in Maine, even on that one congressional district. Uh, Golden has been able to keep winning because he has an image that's distinct from the Democratic Party. Same thing for Mike Garcia uh, in California. Are Republicans, are, uh, is Garcia going to be able to hang on to uh, that that military persona that has, has allowed him to float above where Republican presidential candidates and, and Trump perform? Uh, it could be tougher this year with Trump on the ballot than with, let's say, Gavin Newsom um, and, and a governor's race leading the ballot. But it, it really depends on what kind of electorate do we see in these districts. Right. I'd argue in New York and California, the presidential only voters who are going to show up who didn't show up in the midterms lean a little bit bluer, whereas in some of these Midwestern seats, they lean a little bit redder. And, and um, I'm now going to link, Dave, our first question to this question, which is this realignment. And we're seeing it not just at the presidential level when we talk about college, non-college or suburban rural. We're seeing it in the makeup of Congress. And is it possible, Dave, that at the end of the day, what we see out of the House races this year is that the, the suburbs continue to shift more Democratic. So Democrats win over a place like Palm Springs in California, which has become much more of a uh, suburban area than just sort of a, uh, maybe people think of it as as a just a vacation getaway. And rural areas or maybe more industrial small town areas, whether it's Maine, whether it is Ohio in and around Toledo, that they just go uh, Republican. And we basically just swap some areas of the country and end up kind of with a draw. Well, for cycle after cycle, that seemed to be true until you got to 2022 and Republicans were actually able to, to hang on to a number of these districts, such as Palm Springs, um, mm-hmm. and Albert won re-election narrowly, and they were able to to win over some higher income parts of Long Island. And you had Democrats who were doing well in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania in House races because of the abortion issue. The question is, uh, will that revert to the typical pattern of Democrats excelling in higher income mm. suburbs and Republicans ex- excelling in, in, in blue collar districts like we saw prior to 2022, right. and there is uh, there is a chance that that we we do see that. I uh, I think there's a reason why uh, Democrats are so bullish on that Calvert seat in the Palm Springs area, just as bullish as they are on uh, the Central Valley seats that have a higher Democratic performance historically at the top of the ticket, but the trend line is less favorable. Right. All right, Dave, thanks for answering those questions with me on Mailbag today. And for our listeners, keep the questions coming. Go to cookpolitical.com slash mailbag or call us at 202-739-8520 and press 8. Say your name, where you're calling from, 
We'll be back soon to answer more of your questions. The Odd Years is brought to you by the Cook Political Report team. If you'd like to explore more of what we have to offer, consider subscribing at www.cookpolitical.com slash subscribe. Odd Years listeners can use the discount code ODD10, that's O-D-D, the number 10, to save 10% on any subscription. This offer is only available to new subscribers. The Odd Years is produced by Becca Kaufman, Allie Flynn, and Catherine Hamm. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.